decrease longevity and increase morbidity and mortality. I was lecturing in China about 10 years ago, and it's a very interesting medical society that they have over there in that you have two completely different medical philosophies. The old traditional Chinese-based medicine and the new Western medicine. In the conferences where I teach, it's very interesting that, and I have to lecture through a translator, one half of the class is split. All the naturopathic, natural, traditional trained Chinese doctors will sit on the left side, and all the Western trained doctors will sit on the right side. And they sort of butt heads. They are in conflict. If you are sick and you go to a traditional Chinese doctor, you can be admitted to a traditional Chinese hospital where they will use only traditional Chinese methods. There's no surgery, there's no drugs, it's just herbs, acupuncture, and many different modalities that they have. And it has nothing to do with Western medicine. When you get admitted to a Western trained physician, to a Western style hospital, there's no traditional Chinese medicine that's used. It's only Western surgery and drugs and conventional medicine. Well, one Chinese doctor that was the traditional trained doctor, and I do bond well with them because they think that hormones are natural and replacing them is beneficial. He said, you know, you're, you're talking about anti-aging. He says, do you have any data to support that hormones make you live longer? And I go, well, yeah, there's lots of studies to show that. And he said, where's the studies? And I went, well, they're all over the place. And he goes, show me. And I go, oops, don't have that. So for the next five years, I've accumulated studies to show and prove that hormones will improve longevity and loss of hormones will decrease longevity. Where would you like your levels to be? Should you be on the hormones or not? I find it so very fascinating that I hear endocrinologists teach, preach, and testify to the hormones were not indicated because the levels were normal. Yet in every study, it shows that normal is not optimal, and keeping your levels normal will result in significant morbidity and mortality and an increase in cardiovascular death when you keep your levels normal. Whereas in every study, when you optimize estradiol, progesterone, DHEA, thyroid, and testosterone, there's health benefits to it by decreasing morbidity and mortality and extending longevity. So let's look at those studies. And then I will ask you to ask yourself, where would you like your levels to be? Where would you like your levels of your patients to be? Where would you like the levels of your significant other and your family to be? So this is section two of the science of creating health. For maximum health, where would you like your levels to be? AACE and the endocrine society still say, if your hormone levels are normal, you don't need hormones. They're still stuck on normal. They completely reject receptor site sensitivity, receptor site attachment, loss of signal transduction inside the cell, and decrease in effectiveness of the hormone that has nothing to do with serum levels. For maximum health, your level should be optimal. This is a review of the opinion of the AMA that was from their annual meeting of the House of Delegates in 2009. And they addressed the use of hormones for anti-aging. Remember, you cannot and should not make unsubstantiated claims publicly in your websites, in any mailings that you send out or any advertisement that you use. You have to go by the same standards that the drug companies have to go by. And I know you don't like that because you can look up bioidentical hormones in your town and you can find 100 different doctors that are doing bioidentical hormones that are making unsubstantiated claims. And you say, well, it's not fair that they can make the claims and I can't. Well, you can, but I'm not going to come defend you. I got too many of those cases that I'm defending now because... Somebody wrote a nasty letter to the medical boards. The medical boards went on their websites and reviewed that what they're doing is making unsubstantiated claims 
for hormones, bioidentical hormones, and for anti-aging. You cannot and should not make those claims. This is what they have to say. Well, let's get back to the FDA approval. You cannot advertise or make claim, and the drug companies cannot, for any drug other than for its FDA approval. Estrogen has FDA approval for treating menopause. It is also FDA approved to prevent osteoporosis. You can only make those claims. It is FDA approved to treat symptoms of menopause and prevent osteoporosis. If you say anything other than that and make claims to it, you are violating FDA guidelines. The drug companies cannot make any claims. You cannot make claims either for any other hormones. Testosterone is FDA approved for treating hypogonadism. That is the only claim that you can make. Thyroid is FDA approved for treating hypothyroidism. That is the only claim that you can make, and you should not make any other claims. And if you do, you may end up having to defend yourself and go before the medical board, which is very expensive. So this little section here is to show you and prove to you that it is true. You cannot and should not make anti-aging claims because nothing is FDA approved for anti-aging. How do you define anti-aging? There's no definition. Well, if you can't define it, then how do you study it? You can't. Is there any study that showed any hormone was beneficial and FDA approved for anti-aging? Nope. Why? Because they didn't study it. Why? Well, there's no money, number one. Number two, they don't have a definition, definition of anti-aging. Well, if you don't know how to define it, how do you study it? Well, if you can't study it, you can't make the claim. And if you make the claim for anti-aging, you're violating FDA standards. So let's look at what they say. Current evidence fails to support the efficacy of growth hormone as an anti-aging therapy. I absolutely agree. There's no study that is showing that growth hormone is FDA approved for anti-aging. Don't make that comment. Don't make that claim. Don't make that statement. What did I show you in the last hour about benefits for growth hormone? Tremendous benefits. Can't you state those? No. You can tell a patient that. You can write it in a book like I did. But you cannot use it for advertisement. You cannot hand it out as advertisement to a patient to try to attract them to doing hormones based on false advertisement. So you cannot make that claim. No hormone has ever been tested and FDA approved for anti-aging. No drug has been tested or approved for anti-aging, so you cannot make any anti-aging claims. DHA as an anti-aging supplement shows no meaningful benefit. We looked at all the studies showing health benefits to DHA in part one. That statement is ludicrous. There's a tremendous beneficial effect of DHEA on health and wellness. But true, not for anti-aging. I absolutely agree with them. Don't make anti-aging claims. Well, then can't you then make the claim as to what has been shown in the medical studies? No, you can't. Because when you do, you are then enticing a patient to take hormones based on your enticement because studies showed. You cannot do that. You cannot say that. Yeah, but it's the medical literature. Yes, but you're also advertising something that is not FDA approved for that indication or that use. The definitive evidence of the value of testosterone as an anti-aging therapy in older men does not exist. True, it has never been studied for anti-aging. We don't know how to define it, and we don't know how to study it. Don't make the claim. Did I show you studies of benefit? Tremendous benefits. What happens when you lose it? Tremendous deterioration. You can make the claims of what happens when you lose it. You just cannot make the claims of what happens when you replace it. The long-term use of estrogens with or without progestins causes more risk than benefits. I absolutely agree with that statement. I would never, ever use estrogen along with a progestin. And as you know, when I use the term estrogen, I'm referring to Premarin. When I use the term estradiol, I'm referring to estradiol. I don't use long-term Premarin. And I certainly don't use long-term progestins, and I agree, they cause more risk than benefit. However, that doesn't mean that you should ignore the plethora of data showing benefit to estradiol 
the plethora of data showing harm of progestins and the plethora of data showing benefit and safety of progesterone. But you cannot make those claims or those statements publicly. There's no credible scientific evidence that exists for the so-called bioidentical hormones. I disagree with that because all the articles and studies that we looked at in part one are bioidentical estradiol and progesterone and bioidentical testosterone, but they're not compounded. So just because there's benefit in the studies does not mean that you compounding it is the same. And as a result, you cannot make or state those claims. Compounded bioidenticals are not FDA approved, therefore you cannot make or should not make any claims to superiority of bioidentical hormones over the synthetics. Yes, I know all the studies show that, but it's not FDA approved for that, therefore you cannot make claims or statements that bioidenticals are safer than the synthetics. We all know they are, we all know the harm of the, of the synthetics, we all know the benefit and safety of the bioidenticals. But you cannot make those claims because what you're prescribing is not the same as that what they used in the study. And again, if you make that claim and you mislead the patient to taking hormones, then the medical board and the FDA can come down on you and state, you made the statement that the study showed and that enticed the patient to take the hormones and as a result of your enticement, they took the hormones, which could be harmful. The FDA still thinks and claims that hormones are harmful based on those studies. Despite the widespread promotion of hormones for anti-aging purposes, you cannot make or state that claim publicly. You can tell the patient that, but you can't write it in anything that you hand out to them. The scientific evidence to support these anti-aging claims for HGH is lacking. I absolutely agree. There's no study that showed that HGH did anything for anti-aging. On the other hand, what did it show? Growth hormone review, review section one. Growth hormone is beneficial for everything. As you get older, all the bad things happen. Growth hormone helps reverse those bad things. Don't make claims for anti-aging. That doesn't mean it doesn't work, and it doesn't mean you can't prescribe it or use it. Don't advertise it. Estrogen for the prevention of chronic conditions is not recommended. I agree. I don't use estrogen in the form of Premarin to treat chronic conditions. That doesn't mean I don't use estradiol because every study shows benefit and protection. Every study shows harm when you lose it. Every study shows benefit when you replace it. Estradiol is not Premarin. Don't extrapolate them to be the same. But now you understand why they say. Current evidence does not support the use of testosterone at all in older men. Really? No, it doesn't support the use of it because they make these claims not that it's not beneficial for anti-aging. It's very unfortunate that that is their logic, but that doesn't mean you can't use it and it doesn't mean that it's not beneficial. Based on available scientific evidence, the FDA, the Endocrine Society, American Academy of Endocrinology have taken positions that there's no justifiable reason to use growth hormone for anti-aging. I don't use it for anti-aging, but I use it to help improve health and wellness and decrease visceral and subcutaneous fat and restore our structure and help how we feel and function. That's what I use it for. I don't use it for anti-aging. Use of DHA as an anti-aging supplement should be discouraged. Why? Well, because it's not approved for anti-aging. Yeah, but Look at all the different things that it does. Well, then use it for all those different things. Don't use it for anti-aging. It's thoroughly amazing that they completely ignore the medical data in the literature. So now let's look at studies looking at longevity. This is a nice study looking at reduced longevity in brothers and sisters that were extremely growth hormone deficient in comparison with those that were not. And remember, once you reach age 40 to 50, you're considered, your IGF-1 levels are just as low as young adults that are going to be considered to be deficient. So the benefit of this study is that there's a wealth of information showing the benefits of growth hormone replacement. And the dramatic findings of this study show that patients with either childhood or adult onset growth hormone 
deficiency, replacement is crucial. Why? For cardiovascular protection. This is another study, the Rancho Bernardo study, looking at IGF-1 levels. The relative risk of ischemic heart disease mortality was 38% higher for every 40 milligram per ml decrease in IGF-1 level. The lower your IGF-1, the greater your risk of cardiovascular disease and ischemic heart disease mortality. The higher your level of IGF-1, the greater the protection. Where would you like your levels to be? But you don't qualify based on the severe restricted guidelines. That's true. You don't qualify based on those guidelines, but that doesn't mean that you wouldn't benefit from taking growth hormone because in every study, the higher your IGF-1 level, the less your risk of heart disease. The lower your IGF-1 level, the greater the prediction of cardiovascular disease and death. Where would you like your levels to be? That's my point. The higher the level, the more optimal, the greater the health benefit. We conclude that low baseline levels of IGF-1 increase the risk of ischemic heart disease and fatalities in men and women, independent of other risk factors. Where would you like your levels to be of all hormones? Optimal. But they don't qualify because their levels are, quote, normal. Yes, but they're not optimal. There's a big difference. Low IGF-1, identified in early and advanced atherosclerotic lesions, contributing to the process leading to plaque weakening, plaque rupture, and acute coronary events. In every study, IGF-1 is protective. It protects against plaque deposition. It protects against plaque rupture. Where would you like your level to be? High where it's protective or low that increases your risk. It makes no sense to keep your levels low. But the restrictive guidelines are you don't qualify for replacement. You, well, then you're this guy who's going to die from ischemic heart disease. Well, that's not fair. Yeah, you're right. It's not. Who said it was fair? The increased risk of fatal ischemic events increase with low IGF-1. Low IGF-1 increases mortality. Another study is showing. Is there, any horm is there any study showing that you'll live longer on hormones and that you won't live as long when you don't replace? Yeah, this is a great study showing how protective it is and you'll live longer. There is an anti-aging longevity benefit to replacement. These findings suggest that it's IGF-1 that's involved in the development and progression of fatal coronary atherosclerotic disease in men and women. Measuring IGF-1 can be predictive of those people that are at risk. Well, almost all people over age 40, particularly over age 50, will have low IGF-1 levels. Another study looking at myocardial infarction in an elderly population. Our study shows that low IGF-1 activity increases MI and cardiovascular disease. Where would you like your levels to be? Levels with low circulating IGF-1 are at significantly greater risk of developing cardiovascular disease. We saw how it's protective. It reverses dyslipidemia. It reverses insulin resistance. It lowers visceral and subcutaneous fat and reverses all inflammatory markers. What a great drug it is for cardiovascular protection and it's simply ignored. In fact, it's denigrated. You shouldn't use it because there's no anti-aging protective effects that are FDA approved. But that doesn't mean you can't use it. It doesn't mean you should not use it. The present study found inverse associations between IGF-1 and morbidity and mortality from all causes, both cardiovascular disease as well as cancer. It's pretty amazing, interesting, that we sort of ignore all the medical literature. It just makes no sense. I have somehow or another um, lost my screen. So I'm going to be slightly delayed in getting back on. Chris, um, can you fix my screen so I can get back on to the webinar? Yeah, let me take a look at it. I'm seeing it okay. So. I'm not seeing it on my end. You might need to reconnect to the meeting. Potentially, if you've uh, lost connection, you could lose your screen. Let me... 
Chris, I still see the screen also. You you can see the screen, Mary? Yeah, I can. I can. Okay. Can you see the blue go to meeting icon at the bottom, Neil? Of your screen I'm back. of your uh... I'm back. Okay. I got it. Sorry. Great. Another study, these data suggest that IGF-1, IGF binding protein 3, has potential suppressive tumor effects in prostate cancer. We think that growth hormone causes cancers to grow. <laughs> no. Um, IGF binding protein 1, IGF binding protein 3 are apoptotic to cancer cells. Breast cancer cells, prostate cancer cells. Where would you like your levels to be? I want my levels to be optimal. That's what is shown in the medical studies to protect against cancer. And again, IGF-1 and IGF binding protein 1 and 3 will predict ischemic heart disease mortality. It will also predict cancers. The higher your levels, the more protective against prostate cancer, which is the most common cancer in men. Where would you like your levels to be? Another study looking at cancer, we found a statistically significant decrease in prostate cancer risk across increasing growth hormone quintiles. We're still stuck on numbers. AACE is stuck on numbers. You don't qualify for it. But the studies show that the higher your level, the more protective it is. Yeah, but you don't qualify. You don't qualify for higher levels? No. But that's where all the protection is. Yeah then why shouldn't we all want to achieve optimal levels based on the studies to show the higher the level, the more protective it is, and the less disease and death? Well, because you don't qualify. We don't qualify for protection? No. That makes no sense. Now you see my sarcasm to Big Farm, AACE, the FDA, and the AMA. They just don't get it because they just don't look at the studies. And when I show groups this, they look at me like, well, we didn't know those studies. Yeah, but they're there. The lower the level of growth hormone, the significant increased risk of prostate cancer. Where would you like your levels to be? We see the same thing with testosterone. The lower your testosterone level, the greater your risk of prostate cancer. The higher the level, the more protective it is. I won't go through the different mechanisms. The Endocrine Society recommends against offering testosterone therapy to all older men. Really? Yeah. Why? Because they don't qualify for it. Really? But what about the loss of the health benefit? That's tough. Is there a mortality increase when your level's low? Yes. Is there a mortality decrease when your level is high? Yes. Then why wouldn't you want your levels to be high? Because we don't recommend it. You don't recommend it based on what? Based on FDA restrictions. In every study to date, there's over 100 of them. I'll show you just one. Low testosterone levels were associated with increased mortality. In every study to date, the lower your level, the greater your increased mortality from heart disease and cancer. The higher your level, the more protective it is. Where would you like your levels to be? Remember the theme of this topic? It was mortality. This looked at six-year mortality in men. Testosterone, IGF, and DHEA, all anabolic hormones, were evaluated. Age decrease in anabolic hormone levels is a strong independent predictor of mortality in men. What happens when you look at all three of them? All three of them combined, having multiple hormone deficiencies, rather than just one, is a robust biomarker for health status in older people. I guarantee all older people, and by older meaning over 60, are going to have low levels. They're going to put them at risk. The higher the level, the more protection. The lower the level, the greater the risk. Where would you like your levels to be? And all three of them are predictive. Yet we ignore it. AAC says we don't recommend DHEA. We don't recommend testosterone to older men. And we definitely don't recommend growth hormone. But every study shows there's benefits to longevity when your levels are optimized. Well, we ignore those studies. Low levels, independent, inverse association with atherosclerosis. When you want to build up plaque, keep your levels low. When you want to reverse plaque, then keep your levels high. What did that most recent study show in JAMA? 
optimizing testosterone, it wasn't optimal, they raised it. Increased soft plaque, but that was not hard plaque, and it was an outcome of MI or mortality. In every study, the lower the level, the greater the risk of plaque, the greater the risk of MI, and the greater the increase in morbidity and mortality and death. Yes, to the Chinese doctor, there are studies to show benefit. It doesn't make sense that we ignore them. Testosterone insufficiency, low levels, increased mortality over 20 years, independent of other risk factors. How many of these do we have to see? This is a sad one. Free testosterone concentrations were low in men that developed Alzheimer's disease. The higher the level, the greater the protection. Where would you like your level to be? It makes no sense that we say we don't recommend testosterone in older men. It protects against Alzheimer's disease. It reverses it. You can see it on spec scans. We don't recommend it. You don't recommend it because? Because we don't. But that makes no sense scientifically. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't. JCM, low levels associated with increase in all cause, both cardiac and cancer. Study after study after study shows the same thing. Low levels predict Worsening, high levels are protective. Where would you like your levels to be? High serum testosterone levels predicted a reduced five-year risk, events in elderly men. Where would you like your levels to be? High. But AACE says we don't recommend it. The FDA says we don't recommend it. So you're recommending an increase in risk of death that's what you're recommending? Yes. By not raising the level? Yes. That's what we're recommending. But that, that, that makes no sense whatsoever. You're right. This is from the Journal of American College of Cardiology. What they say and what they recommend makes absolutely no sense based on the literature and the science. It's thoroughly amazing. Our findings of significant inverse association between testosterone levels and the risk of fatal and non-fatal cardiac events support and extend previous work showing an association between testosterone and cardiovascular mortality. Where would you like your levels to be? It's absolutely inexcusable that they say and recommend what they say, and it's purely based on politics and the desire to restrict. In the present study, testosterone levels in the highest quartile are associated with reduced cardiovascular risk in comparison with lower levels. Study after study after study shows the same thing, and the fact that we ignore it makes no sense. Here's the nice part about testosterone. We know that heart disease is an inflammatory disease process. How do you reduce the inflammation? You have to reduce visceral fat. You have to improve the body composition. With testosterone deficiency, there's an increase in visceral fat and insulin resistance and systemic inflammation. How do you reduce it? Testosterone. Yeah, but no one recommends it. Yeah, you're right. They don't recommend reducing the diffuse systemic inflammation that causes heart disease. They don't recommend that. Yeah, you're right. They don't. In every study to date so far, in patients receiving Cazodex and Lupron for prostate cancer, it protected them against getting and dying from prostate cancer. Unfortunately, they all died from cardiovascular disease first. Those in the placebo group didn't die. Those that got Cazodex and Lupron did die of heart disease. When you wipe out testosterone, it significantly increases systemic inflammation, which will increase plaque deposition and plaque rupture. And that's what AACE wants? Really? Yep. Now you see my criticism. Now you see my passion. Now you see my frustration. And it just makes no sense whatsoever. JCEM, low testosterone levels, increased risk of mortality compared with those that receive testosterone treatment. And the reason you don't want to give testosterone, the reason you don't want to recommend it, well, because they don't recommend it for use in older men. Yeah, but the mortality benefit is tremendous. Uh, well, we ignore that. Really? You just want to watch them die and you can protect, you give statins to help protect it. Why don't you want to give testosterone? because we don't recommend it. Now you see the interesting controversy of hormone replacement. 
This is the great study that I was alluding to from JCEM. Testosterone has immune modulation properties, and if you use enough of it and you test these on your own, you'll see the, the importance of it. Testosterone suppresses the expression of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin 1b, interleukin 6, uh, and increases the anti-inflammatory cytokine, interleukin 10, and as well as C-reactive protein. If you measure tumor necrosis factor alpha, you can, and you measure C-reactive protein, you can. Before and after testosterone, you will see those numbers dramatically improve. Don't measure it in a month. Give it six months to a year when you reduce the visceral fat and all these numbers will normalize. You cannot accomplish that with statins. Statins will increase the visceral fat and wipe out your testosterone, which will increase your inflammatory cytokines, the opposite of what we want to do, which is really a shame. In conclusion, testosterone replacement shifts the cytokine balance to a state of reduced inflammation and lowers total cholesterol. What a great drug it is, it's a shame that it's denigrated, and it's a shame that there are peer societies don't recommend it and actually preach against it, purely for politics and economics. Inverse relationships were observed for deaths due to cardiovascular cause and cancer. So we all focus on testosterone protection against cardiovascular disease and strokes. But what about cancer? Um, there's a recent study that came out that showed that testosterone protects against 11 different types of cancer. Um, it has apoptotic effects on cancer cells. It reduces visceral fat. It reduces the systemic inflammation that causes cancers to progress. So there's a multitude of different beneficial effects that have been reported in the literature, but overall you still have to look at outcome. Does giving testosterone help improve outcome and reduce morbidity and mortality from cancer? Yes, it does. To the Chinese doctor, yes, there are studies. Endogenous testosterone concentrations inversely associated with mortality due to cardiovascular disease and cancer. Study after study shows the same thing. Let's shift gears. Estrogen. We all know how bad estrogen is. Let me tell you a little story. Um, I recently was contacted by a physician that took the course because this physician referred his mother to a doctor on the East Coast that had taken the World Link courses, one through four, and had a pretty good reputation for prescribing hormones. Um, this doctor's mother was 72 years of age and went to see this doctor, lady doctor, for hormone replacement. And she was told by this lady doctor that she would not prescribe hormones to this 72-year-old lady because she was too old for hormones and that the hormones could potentially cause harm. The doctor called me up and read me the right act that this doctor practicing on the East Coast and it's on the World Link sites um, is giving this advice to patients that they don't recommend hormones because of potential risk. Um, the male doctor was flabbergasted. I was too absolutely appalled that a doctor could still be misled and mislead and think that somehow or another estradiol causes harm. And they're extrapolating the harm of estradiol to Premarin. They should not, cannot do that because all the studies show in all the early versus late studies that estradiol does not cause the estrogenicity and the plaque rupture in MI and stroke that Premarin does. But everyone still fears and thinks that it does, but it doesn't. And when this poor lady that's 72 is told, no, she doesn't get hormones, what's going to happen to her plaque? It's going to continue to build up because she's not on estrogen. What would happen to her plaque if she was on estradiol? It reverses it, and all the studies show that. What about testosterone? It reverses it. What about the visceral fat? it will lower it. So not treating this patient because of fear of this plaque rupture with Premarin has now led this lady to be concerned about taking hormones and fear it, where in reality she should have no fear of it and she should have been prescribed it. Because they still just don't get it. I can't understand 
why relatively intelligent doctors don't get it. It's because they're reactionary and they are not analytical. If you're analytical, you'll be able to analyze these studies and figure out it's not harmful. If you're reactionary, you'll say, oh yeah, it is harmful, the WHI should have was harmed, so we shouldn't use it. And then it'll increase your risk of heart disease, strokes, Alzheimer's disease, urogenital atrophy, urinary infections, mood swings, osteoporosis, etc., by not taking estrogen. It just thoroughly bogs, bogs my mind to let people suffer and deteriorate because you are afraid of something that does not exist. It makes no sense. So let's look at estrogen. That's extremely confusing. We'll look at a lot more in section three and four. Estrogen therapy related risk occur at an absolute frequency of less than one per 1,000 women or 10 per 10,000. And they're still considered to be rare risk. Well, what is that risk of estrogen therapy? The risk was blood clot. We'll look at those numbers to really see what that risk is. Again, this is estrogen, which is premarin. The overall risk of DVT events is rare with estrogen therapy. That's premarin. In the WHI trial, there were eight events per 10,000 women in the whole entire cohort of women that took estrogen. However, if you whittle that down to women under age 60, the relative risk of blood clots was 4 per 10,000. 8 per 10,000 in the whole entire cohort was statistically significant by one patient, which is why they make claim to don't take oral estrogen, it causes blood clots. In 8 out of 10,000, and you say don't take oral because of 8 out of 10,000? Yeah, but it was statistically significant. So you're going to treat all 10,000 women with a transdermal estrogen and avoid oral estrogen because of 8 per 10,000. Yes. All right, well, let's look at within 10 years of menopause or under age 60. That was 4 per 10,000. That was not statistically significant. So when you make claims that estrogen causes blood clots, it's in older women, not younger women, not within the 10-year window of menopause. And in fact, 4 per 10,000 was not statistically significant, and therefore it means that there is safety to using oral estrogen in the form of Premarin in younger women within the 10-year window of menopause. Please do not extrapolate that to estradiol but everyone does. The DVT risk of Premarin are similar to those of other commonly used medications such as Phenobrate with diabetics. We commonly prescribe Tricor for lowering triglycerides. Well, the risk of blood clots with that is the same or even greater than that with Premarin. We don't bat an eye when we prescribe these drugs and the risk is the same. But yet with estrogen, oh, you can't prescribe estrogen orally, it causes blood clots. Yeah, but what about Tricor, well, what about those drugs? Um, well, we don't worry about those. Well, you should, well, you don't. Now you see the reason that this article is written in menopause management. And what it does is it looks at and critiques and criticizes our assumptions of what we do and why we do what we do, which do not make sense based on numbers. However, in all the studies, in addition to the HERS and WHI, but all the other studies looking at statins and aspirin, either aspirins or, or cholesterol-lowering therapy with statins has been demonstrated to significantly reduce total mortality of coronary heart disease in women. In spite of the fact that there's a multitude of studies out there, we do not see any beneficial effect in reducing mortality with a statin or with aspirin. The cumulative data indicates that estrogen replacement therapy reduces coronary heart disease and total mortality in women under age 60. So, which drugs does everyone get? Aspirin and statins. Any decrease in mortality in any study? In primary disease studies? None. Well, then why does everyone use it? Because they're extrapolating the benefit with secondary studies to primary. You shouldn't do that. Which one don't they get? They don't get estrogen. Why? Because it's harmful. 
but all the data shows that it's estrogen that reduces coronary heart disease mortality, not aspirin or statins. But which one don't they get? They don't get estrogen. Yeah, but that's the one that's reducing the mortality. Why do we not get it? Why don't we not understand it? Why do we ignore the data in the studies? Everyone uses aspirin and statins. I can't believe the number of women that come to me that do not have heart disease that are on a statin and an aspirin, and they don't need to be. And yet they come to me and say, well, my doctor told me I can't take estrogen because it causes blood clots or something. And yet it's only the estrogen that reduces the cardiac mortality, and yet they don't get it. And yet everyone gets aspirin and statins, which has no effect in any study. It's thoroughly amazing why we do what we do is completely against the data. The cumulative data across six randomized trials and data on 11,000 women are not sufficiently large enough to demonstrate that lipid lowering with statins significantly reduces total mortality. Sorry, it doesn't. When you stretch the, the Jupiter study, um, most recently it showed for primary disease prevention, yes, there was slight improvement, but they don't know the true rule numbers because they didn't release them. They just stated it in a study, but they still hide those, those figures from us. Why are they hiding it from us? Why don't they give us those numbers? They're afraid to. Why don't they? That's a whole other topic in itself. But nevertheless, in all these other studies, lipid lowering does not reduce mortality under primary disease circumstances. The WHI showed a null effect of aspirin on primary endpoint of non-fatal MI, stroke, and cardiovascular death. It didn't benefit, benefit, it didn't harm, but everyone gets it. Statins didn't benefit, didn't harm, but everyone gets it. Estrogen benefits them all. They don't get it. They don't receive it. Why? Because we fear it. The East Coast doctor is fearing giving estrogen because of this supposed increase in heart attacks and strokes with Premarin. Total mortality and cardiovascular death from any cause are unaffected by aspirin or statins. Estrogen has effects on calcium metabolism at the arterial wall, which accounts for its unique ability to reduce calcium content of atherosclerotic plaque. It decreases coronary artery calcification. It decreases intermediate thickness, plaque score, and calcium score. It reverses and shrinks calcified plaque and reduces calcium scores. Why don't you want to accomplish that? Well, because you're afraid of plaque rupture. That's not estradiol. Estradiol does not cause plaque rupture in any study. It causes reversal of the hard plaque that is so predictive of plaque rupture and heart attack. But yet you don't use it. You're afraid of it. Why is it? Well, because of the WHI trial. Don't extrapolate. Well, you have to assume. Don't assume. None of the NIH studies show that estradiol orally caused any harm. Although ischemic stroke was reduced by 24% with aspirin, hemorrhagic stroke increased by 24% with aspirin. Well, that's good. But why do they all get aspirin? It makes no sense. Well, we've got to give them something because we can't give them estrogen. Why don't you give them estrogen? Well, because it's harmful. GI bleeding was increased by 22% with aspirin. I've had two people on aspirin die, blood out in the middle of the night, and they really didn't need aspirin. It made me, uh, it opened my eyes to the use of aspirin in people that don't need it. Overall randomized control trials show no overall reduction in cardiovascular events with aspirin. Yet, everyone gets it. With estrogen, there's a 32% significant reduction in coronary heart disease in women under age 60. What was the relative risk? The relative risk is 0.6. There's no reduction with statins or aspirin. There's a 32% reduction with estrogen, and the relative risk is 0.6. That's tremendous protection. Then why don't you use it? Well, because it causes plaque rupture and blood clots. It does not cause blood clots. Yes, it does in older women. That's 8 per 10,000. I don't use permanent in older women. Well, you have to extrapolate. No, you don't extrapolate the same in older women with estradiol. No study showed any increase in blood clots with estradiol. It's only Premarin due to the increased estrogenicity. Why don't you get that? 
Well, because they don't understand it. Why? Because they're not analytical. They're reactionary. Premarin significantly reduced several composite coronary heart disease outcomes by 34 to 45%, almost 50% reduction in heart disease outcomes. It's zero with statins and aspirin. It's 50% with estrogen. They don't get aspirin. Nobody prescribes it because everyone fears it. Shame on them. The cumulative data indicated a 39% reduction in total mortality in women less than age 60 on estrogen. Yes, the Chinese doctor questions it. Here it is. There's a 40% reduction in total mortality in women on estrogen. Does it make you live longer? Yes. Does it reduce mortality? Yes. Then why doesn't everyone get it? Because doctors simply don't understand it. They're not analytical. They don't know the studies. They don't read. They're reactionary. Unlike lipid-lowering therapy, estrogen therapy reduces coronary artery calcium. And you can measure it, and you can watch it be reduced. And it is the most predictive factor in plaque rupture and plaque progression. And you can reverse it with oral estrogen and oral estradiol. But everyone refuses to use it because they don't understand it and they fear it. And what they use is a statin and aspirin, which is worthless. Estrogen therapy reduces atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, and total mortality in women under age 60. Aspirin and statins do not. All doctors prescribe aspirin and statins. They don't prescribe estrogen, which is what reduces mortality. What is it about it that you don't grasp or understand? They don't understand that they cannot and should not extrapolate the harm in older women with Premarin to younger women with estradiol. They don't get it. What about older women in estradiol? No studies. Later we'll look at this nice meta-analysis that was published in Naturitas. It was a meta-analysis of seven studies in Europe of using estradiol. And in every study, it was a secondary study. These patients already had established heart disease. If estrogen is bad and causes plaque rupture and you shouldn't use it in older women with heart disease, then in these studies, which there are seven, you should not use oral estradiol in women that have established heart disease. But they did, and guess what they found? One, no increased risk of MI. Two, a decreased risk of MI and plaque rupture. Three, a decrease in calcification. Oral estradiol was protective in this meta-analysis of seven studies. There were all secondary prevention studies in women with pre-established disease that took oral estradiol. They already had the heart disease, and they derived benefit. And yet, people over here refuse to give estrogen to women without heart disease because they think that they may have heart disease and they may rupture it. They just don't comprehend it. The therapeutic effect of estrogen is not seen with any other intervention for coronary artery calcium, period. That which works the best is not being utilized because we don't understand it. Why don't we understand it? I guess they just don't go to the courses. Yeah, everyone should. The effect of statin therapy on breast cancer risk, you're not going to like this, ranges from 10 less cancers to 75 increased cancers for 10,000 women a year. What you didn't see before was this chart that shows that one or two studies showed protection with statins. 80% of the studies show there's an actual increase in risk, risk and incidence of breast cancer with statins. So this was a cumulative looking at all of the different, here it is. There are some studies to show 10 less cancers, 8 less cancers, 2 less cancers. But in these studies up here, there was significant increased incidence of cancer with statins. Notice down here the West trial. The West trial used oral estradiol. There were two less cancers. Notice the WHI trial here. There's eight less cancers with estrogen. There's significantly greater cancer risk with statins. Which hormones don't women get? Estrogen. Which drugs do all women get? Statins, which increase the risk. It makes no sense whatsoever. Unbelievable. 33% increased risk of breast cancer with statin use. Average seven per year. Randomized controlled trials. 
In the WHI trial, breast cancer decreased with Premarin by 18%. All women think that estrogen causes cancer. The studies show, no, it decreases it. All people think, oh, well, statins are really good for you, and they get prescribed, whereas in reality, there's a multitude of studies to show an increased risk of cancer. Everyone fears estrogen. Everyone doesn't fear statins. Increased risk of breast cancer, decreased risk of breast cancer. They just don't comprehend it because they're not analytical. They don't know the literature. They don't know the studies. Resulted in eight fewer cases of breast cancer per 10,000 women in the WHI trial. Which one would you like to be on? The one that increases the risk or decreases the risk? This is the West trial, and again, with 17 beta estradiol, there were two less cases of cancer in the whole entire cohort, as we see with all the other estradiol studies in addition. Cumulative data in cases in postmenopausal women less than 60, estrogen therapy significantly reduces total mortality and coronary heart disease. What is it that we don't understand about that statement? It reduces total mortality. Statins and aspirin don't. Estrogen does. Which one don't we use? Estrogen. Why? Because we fear it. Why? Because we don't understand it. It makes no sense. That's why this article was written, so that maybe we can understand. DBT risk with estrogen is rare, and the risk is no greater than other commonly used medications. The evidence of a preventive role of estrogen in certain postmenopausal women is stronger than ever, but yet we all fear it and don't understand it. And like the lady doctor on the East Coast, oh, no, we don't want to give you estrogen. There, I was told that she said, well, the doctors are like Rousier on the West Coast. They're, they're more progressive. They're, they're more aggressive. But we're very conservative here on the East Coast. We don't do that because we don't want to cause harm. Really? By not giving this poor woman hormones and estrogen, you are causing so much more harm and you don't realize it because you're not analytical. You're reactionary. Really too bad. The WHI confirms 40 years of consistent observational data showing that women who initiate estrogen therapy in close proximity to the menopause within the 10-year window have a significant reduction in total mortality and cancer as well as coronary heart disease. Read it and weep. Understand what that statement means and what it says. And understand that most doctors, including the cardiology world, will not understand this statement because they do not understand the studies and they don't understand the implications of the studies. Estrogen therapy reduces breast cancer risk with efficacy similar to that of the selective estrogen receptor modulators or SERMs. It's actually protective. Now there's a big push by the drug companies, which is unfortunate, to use the SERMs, to use Arimidex, anastrozole, to protect against breast cancer. And what you're doing is significantly increasing the risk of coronary artery disease, and you're increasing the morbidity and mortality associated with estrogen deprivation. They didn't read that last statement on the beneficial effects of protection. They completely ignored the reactionary and not analytical. Let's see what happens when you lose estrogen. Numerous reports, and they're all the same, link oophorectomy to higher rates of cardiovascular disease from loss of estrogen, osteoporosis, hip fractures, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, memory impairment, that's great, decline in sexual function, urogenital atrophy, decreased positive psychological well-being, depression, mood swings, sleep disturbance, adverse skin and body changes, adverse ocular changes, macular degeneration, loss of central vision, hot flashes and urogenital atrophy. That's what happens when you use when you lose estrogen. And this doctor on the East Coast did not want to prescribe estrogen for the 72-year-old lady suffering from this. How can you deny the improvement with estrogen? How can you ignore the numerous effects showing what happens when you lose estrogen? It's thoroughly mind-boggling that they don't get it. Preservation of ovaries until 65 is associated with higher survival rates. What does that mean? That means even men, women that are menopausal that still have their ovaries will still derive some benefit from the estrogen that's produced by the ovaries, even though it's not much. It's better than 
removing the ovaries and completely wiping out any production of estradiol. The conclusion here is keep the ovaries in. There's a survival benefit to it, even though you're in menopause and it's not working. I wouldn't do that. If they need to be removed, remove them, and then replace it with estrogen. But it's interesting that even in menopausal women, maintaining the ovaries provides a survival benefit. Ovarian conservation until at least age 65 seems to benefit long-term survival. Why? Because ovaries produce hormones. Bilateral oophorectomy before age, age, 45, age 45, significant increase in cardiovascular mortality. Cardiac mortality, estrogen replacement reduces this. And what they call NAMs recommend, low dose, shortest period of time, and then stop it. And then what happens? Then you significantly increase your mortality. But that's not right, you're right. Well, yeah, but then you die. Yeah, you're right. But that doesn't make sense, you're right. Then why don't we grasp it? I don't know. I don't get it. I don't understand why we don't grasp it. I can grasp it. What I don't grasp is why others don't grasp it. Reduction in estrogen is associated with un unfavorable changes in serum lipids. When you go through that menopausal transition, you get dyslipidemia. When you get dyslipidemia, you increase atherosclerosis in the carotids. When you increase plaque, you reduce blood flow. And you increase carotid artery intermediate thickness. How do you reverse carotid artery intermediate thickness? Oral estradiol. But everyone's afraid of prescribing oral estradiol. Yes, but that's what reduces it in the studies. Don't extrapolate the harm of Premarin to estradiol that we don't see in any of those studies. Nurses' health study, oophorectomy doubles the risk of MI. Oophorectomy before age 50 increases the risk of MI and heart disease. What is it that we don't understand about this and the replacement of it? That analysis, observational studies found more than double the risk of heart disease when you took out their ovaries. Every study shows the same thing. And when you're not treated with estrogen, then you die. Total cardiovascular mortality was significantly increased. That can be decreased and prevented with estrogen that women don't get. What do they get instead? Statins and aspirin. No statistically significant association with mortality was found in women treated with estrogen. Estrogen therapy alleviates the excess risk of heart disease, but many women don't receive this therapy. Why? Because their doctors don't understand. Why? Because they're scared. Why? Because they spoke with this East Coast doctor that said, no, you're too old for estrogen. Really? No, we're conservative out here. We just want to let you deteriorate and die. Really? That's what you want. It makes no sense. What is it that you did not get in these courses? Did you miss part two? I don't understand. Shifting gears. If you're on estrogen but you want to lose the benefit of estrogen, what can you do? Estrogen replacement therapy is associated with improvement of cognitive deficits and reduced incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Read it and leap. Every study shows the same thing. When you want to increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease, do not take estrogen. When you want to increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease, go see this East Coast doctor who thinks women over 70 should not receive estrogen. I still can't get over that. It drives me nuts. Estrogen and progesterone alone in combination protect against glutamate toxicity of the brain. In contrast, when Provera was given, it failed to protect against glutamate toxicity. Progesterone has protective effects. It's synergistic with estrogen. Provera antagonizes all the beneficial effects of estrogen. It makes no sense to use Provera. Yet when you read the PDR, the adverse effects of progesterone are identical to that of Provera, which scares doctors away from using micronized progesterone, which is synergistic with estrogen, not antagonistic, as is Provera. There's this BCLT, uh, BCL2 gene. It's good. This gene is good. When you upregulate it, it's protective. It is upregulated by estradiol. It's also upregulated by micronized progesterone. It is downregulated and blocked with Provera. It's unconscionable that any physician in the U.S. would still prescribe Provera to their patients. It's absolutely unconscionable with the amount of data and negative literature against it and the increased risk of breast cancer 
the 5,000 successfully settled lawsuits against Wyeth for Provera causing breast cancer. It's just phenomenal. And yet we ignore that and still continue to prescribe Provera. Oh, we're just going to use a smaller dose. Oh, that means you're going to get a smaller breast cancer. Oh, that's good. It makes no sense whatsoever. I hope you enjoy and appreciate my passion based on the medical literature that shows what we should be doing but what we're not doing. When you lose your hormones, increase in all-cause mortality, heart disease, strokes, cancer. Replace it with the right ones and reverse that. Estrogen also decreases colon, risk of colon cancer. The most common cancer between both sexes is colon cancer. Estrogen can increase the risk of endometrial cancer. Oppose it with progesterone. Estrogen was shown to decrease all-cause mortality. That's both cardiac disease and cancer. One of the cancers it protects against is colon cancer. It's also consistent with several published studies suggesting a protective role of estrogen in the development of colorectal cancer. Every woman should be on estrogen unless there's a contraindication, and the only contraindication would be an active breast cancer. Progestins. This was published in OBGYN Management. The relative risk of invasive breast cancer was 1.0 with progesterone. In other words, no increased risk. The relative risk of breast cancer with other progestins increased significantly, like by how much? Let's look at the chart. With micronized progesterone, the relative risk of cancer was 1.0. Perfect. The same as placebo. The relative risk with Provera was 1.5. Yikes. The relative risk with the new progestin, norethadrone, which is prescribed over Provera, the relative risk of breast cancer with norethadrone was 2.1. Great. Fantastic. Which would you like to be on, the relative risk of 1.0 or the one that increases your relative risk of breast cancer significantly? You want your wife to be on this stuff? You want your patients to be on this stuff? What does ACOG and NAM say? Well, the use of micronized progesterone could be an alternative. Could be? Well, you could still use the synthetic progestin, just use a smaller dose. Okay, great. Why? Well, you'd get a smaller cancer. Great. It makes no sense whatsoever what we do. If you want to protect against breast cancer and the morbidity and mortality from it, use progesterone, not a progestin. Studies report that progesterone is associated with a lower risk of breast cancer than the progestins, which significantly increase the risk. It makes no sense to use any progestin at all anymore. Don't forget the Cache County study. I will summarize it. Summary is, prior hormone use is associated with a reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease, but you have to use it for at least 10 years in order to derive any benefit. What does ACOG and NAMS now claim? Use the shortest dose, smallest dose for the shortest period of time and stop it. And when you stop it, what happens? You increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease. Well, that's great. Did they not read this study? I guess not. Yeah, but what about the harm? Um, what harm? I don't see any harm in estradiol progesterone. Yeah, but with Prem and Provera, I don't prescribe Prem and Provera and don't assume and extrapolate that they're the same. We miss the brain. Long-term estrogen therapy is associated with reduced all-cause mortality and confers this protection primarily through the reduction in cardiovascular disease, but there's also protection against cancer and Alzheimer's disease and diabetes. And the reason we don't want to give it is because we don't understand it. Vitamin D is a hormone. It has a structure very similar to estrogen. Low vitamin D is independently associated with an increase in cardiovascular mortality. Where would you like your levels to be? As the Chinese doctor says, where are the studies that show that there's a benefit as far as longevity? Here's one. Vitamin D levels are independently associated with all cause and cardiovascular mortality. The lower your level, the increase your mortality. The higher the level, the more protective. Where would you like your levels to be? Estrogen is important for cognitive maintenance. 
Estrogen is important for the neuronal network because of the protection against toxic damage. Estrogen is important because of protection against free radical induced injury. Estrogen is important because it attenuates the toxicity of beta amyloid protein. The most compelling evidence to date is that estrogen is neuroprotective, particularly in preventing and delaying Alzheimer's disease because of the protection against the deposition of beta amyloid proteins, which no drug does. Only hormones do. And yet we ignore those studies and we ignore those hormones. The primary pathology is the deposition of this protein that kills the neurons. And you can protect against it with estrogen. You can protect against the cell death. What is it that we do not understand about all these data studies and research? Why is it that we ignore it? There's this enzyme called alpha-secretase. Alpha-secretase blocks the production of beta amyloid protein. How do you increase alpha-secretase activity? You increase alpha-secretase activity with 17-beta-estradiol. It protects, it reverses. And the reason we don't want to use it is because, well, the lady doctor on the East Coast says she's conservative. Conservative how? She doesn't want to protect against Alzheimer's disease? I don't get it. I simply don't get it. Estrogen deprivation due to lack of ovarian function leads to beta amyloid precipitation. And this can be reversed by estrogen administration that most doctors are afraid of or don't want to do because they don't understand. Reactionary, not analytical. Estrogen clearly has many important neuroprotective properties. One could reasonably postulate it would be beneficial in Alzheimer's disease. What is it that we don't understand about this? Well, because we fear estrogen. Why do we fear it? Because we don't understand the literature. We don't understand the studies. We're reactionary, not analytical. Estrogen should be started at menopause and continued indefinitely. Okay, here's the most important paragraph of the morning. Estrogen is a possible preventing agent for Alzheimer's disease is an issue of overwhelming importance when the public health impact is considered. When I become Surgeon General, everyone will get estrogen free. Estrogen acts to enhance cell differentiation, increases neuronal growth. It's an anti-apoptotic hormone. You lose neurons with beta amyloid protein. Estrogen is anti-apoptotic. It makes the neurons live longer. It has benefits in increasing the expression of APOE. There's tremendous benefits to estrogen on the brain that we completely fail to understand, appreciate, and acknowledge. All prospective studies have shown an improvement of Alzheimer's disease with estrogen. Let me say it again. You missed it. All prospective studies, the patient has Alzheimer's disease. We're going to give them estradiol. I was told once the patient has Alzheimer's disease, you cannot give them estrogen. It makes it worse. No, you obviously don't know the prospective studies with Alzheimer's disease and estradiol. They clinically improve. Their spec scans improve. Their beta amyloid protein diminishes. And the clinical outcomes or symptomatic improvement is tremendous. What do we give? Nerocep and Amenda, worthless. What's the only thing that works? Estradiol. Which one don't they get? Estradiol. Why? Well, because we're conservative and we don't get it. It makes no sense whatsoever. Studies have shown a 70% estrogen-related reduction in Alzheimer's disease. And what is it that we do not understand about these studies? These findings have enormous public health implications. And the reason we ignore it is because we're conservative here on the East Coast. Really? You don't understand the health implications of estrogen deprivation and the protection of Alzheimer's disease that you can accomplish with it? No, we don't appreciate it because we're, we're conservative. This is my letter to everyone on the East Coast that has to deal with conservative doctors. Move to the West Coast. We're not conservative. 
The window of opportunity is within the first 10 years of menopause. That's with Premarin. If you're going to avoid blood clots and use it within the first 10 years, it's safe. But every study beyond the 10-year window with estradiol is also safe. Even in women that were 80 and 90 years of age, they received estradiol for the first time. Even women in that meta-analysis that already had pre-established cardiac disease, they derived benefit. There was no plaque rupture. There was plaque decrease. There was a decrease in calcified plaque. There was a reduction in intermediate thickness. There was a reduction in MI in secondary studies with estradiol. What is it that you do not understand about that? We didn't know about the study. Nobody showed us. Come take the course. I'll show you the studies. And then you can become passionate like I am and not reactionary, but you can become analytical. Women that use hormones for a long period of times have lower rates of mortality and heart disease in comparison with women that don't. Which group would you like to be in? Well, back here on the East Coast, we're conservative. We let women die from estrogen deprivation. Really? You let them die from heart disease? Yes. Why? Well, because we fear it, because we don't understand the studies. I hope that now you understand the studies and the importance of understanding this. This is from the American Journal of Medicine. 19 randomized trials were uh, evaluated. Um, Bayesian, which is the most powerful way of doing a meta-analysis, showed a significant reduction in total mortality. There you are, a Chinese doctor. Reduction in total mortality in postmenopausal women that take estrogen in comparison with women that receive no treatment. The most powerful meta-analysis shows protection. And the reason you don't want to use it is because we're conservative on the East Coast. It makes no sense that you ignore the data and the studies. DHEA, low DHEA also protects death from all causes, cardiovascular disease, cancer. Another study, 27-year study showing that the lower your DHEA, it's a greater predictor of longevity. The higher your DHEA, the lower your blood pressure, blood sugar, diabetes, and heart disease. I remember this endocrinologist saying, we never prescribe DHEA. It's not good for anything. Really? Um, I guess you don't read the literature. Well, the literature shows that it's of extreme benefit. Then well, what is it about it that you ignore it? It makes no sense to ignore the studies. DHEA and protection against cardiovascular disease. DHEA levels are inversely related to death from cardiovascular disease. Where would you like your level to be? The higher, the more protective, the lower the increased risk of disease. I guess the endocrine world ignores this. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine. Why do you ignore it? Why did they do the study and why do you ignore it? Okay, coming down the home stretch, thyroid. Decreasing levels of free T3 are associated with poor outcomes on virtual all domains of function. Yeah, but this is a mortality lecture. Okay, let's get to that. Low levels of free T3 are associated with an accelerated increase in disability, declining global cognitive function, translated, doctor, I'm losing my memory. Well, that's too bad. Isn't there something you can give me? No. What about optimizing thyroid? No, that doesn't work. Really? Well, my friend's on thyroid, and she says she's much better. Decreasing levels of free T3 are associated with increased mortality. The American Thyroid Association says free T3 is a worthless test. It doesn't predict anything. Really? JAMA says, the lower your T3, the greater your risk of mortality. This is a mortality lecture. Where would you like your levels to be? Well, why'd you prescribe thyroid if the TSH was normal? Because your T3 was low. Well, why does your T3 need to be high? Well, if you want to live longer, it should be. That's why we use it. It makes no sense to ignore the literature. In our study, we found significant association between low levels of the T3 and increased mortality. I want my level to be optimal. It is. Me and mine, our free T3s are five and six. We feel better, we function better, our cholesterol's low, our visceral fat is down. The endocrine society say, if your TSH is normal, you don't need T3. They completely do not grasp it and understand it. Lastly, this is the last one. Recent studies suggest that relatively low thyroid function within the clinical reference range is associated with increased risk of heart disease. 
yeah, but the level was normal. Why did you give it to them? Because the level was in the low normal. Well, why does it need to be high normal? Look at the study and see what it shows. In this study, if your TSH is low, your hazard risk for cardiac disease was much less. When your TSH was 1.6 to 2.4, there was a significant increased risk of coronary heart disease. And when your TSH was in the highest reference range, 2.5 to 3.5, which is still perfectly normal, there was a significant increased risk of cardiac disease and death. Where would you like your TSH to be? I want mine to be around 1.0. Or less. If you maintain it in the normal range from 1 to 2 and 2 to 3, you significantly increase your risk of mortality from cardiovascular disease. That's why we do what we do. Results indicate that relatively low but clinically normal thyroid function increases the risk of fatal heart disease. It increases mortality. Yeah, but your levels are normal. I know. They're not optimal. There's a difference between normal in the reference range and optimal. The TSH should be low. The free T3 should be high. Well, this was a nice long lecture. Um, it took a long time. I'm sorry that it took so long. But nevertheless, um, I wanted everyone to see and appreciate the importance of optimizing thyroid for cardiovascular disease protection in elderly women, as well as all the other hormones that also do the same. OK, I hope that was fun. Um, I know it was long and intensive. I hope that you're able to split this up. I'm, I'm finished with section one and two, and I will entertain any questions. Chris, Dana, are there any questions? Now, can I just interrupt real quickly? Um, if anyone joined us a little bit later, if you want to leave a question for Dr. Rosier, if you look in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a chat box where you can enter your questions to Dr. Rosier. Back over to you, Neil. I'm pooped. I'm tired. Um, it's a blue bird day outside. Temperature is around 25 degrees. Sunshine, blue skies. Um, I wish everyone a great day. Thank you so much. See you at part two. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Rosier. We look forward to seeing everyone at part two. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.